So I'm going to kick start us with a few formalities. Uh, the session's being recorded and that includes this main session and your breakout rooms. And that's mainly so that we as a project team can really capture your thoughts and capture the map accurately, help inform the next meetings and the work of this community as a whole. So before I just run through that plan for the session, I'm going to quickly unshare and I want to start with a really, really huge thank you to the project team because it's those guys, these guys that have really brought everything together today and have helped shape this event and helped move things forward from our event back in November. So I'm going to ask the project team to pop their cameras on and if the rest of the community can pop their cameras off because we've got Oh, over 60 people on the call. So um, project team, pop your cameras on and I'd love you to introduce yourselves, please. Um, so I'm going to start with Beth. Morning, everyone. Lovely to see you all. My name's Beth. I am one of the falls prevention practitioners at Sherwood Forest Hospitals in Mansfield, Ashfield, Newark and Sherwood um, and a physiotherapist by background. Thanks, Beth. Rachel, do you want to go next? Hi, everyone. Rachel from uh, the Active Knot team. Active Knot is an organisation that works across uh, the county and city. Thanks, Rachel. Fran? Morning, everyone. Um, I'm Fran Platz. Um, I work at Sherwood Forest Hospitals, predominantly in therapy services, uh, but also within the trust supporting the Falls agenda. Um, it's amazing to see you all here this morning. Incredible. Thank you so much. Um, I look forward to working with you this morning. Lovely. And Adam? Hi, I'm Adam. I work for Active Knox as well, but I sort of work in the Martin Com side of things, so I support the group in that way. Ah, oh, lovely. And my name's Alice. I'm Alice Kilby. I'm also a physiotherapist and I'm consultant therapist for Falls Prevention for Nottinghamshire Healthcare. Um, I'm going to reshare my screen and we're going to go back through the plan for today. So uh, we're going to uh, start with uh, a patient story here. The reason we're all here to support our patients, our clients, and we're going to hear a little bit of a story from a, a, a patient that Beth will introduce. We're then going to spend a bit of time thinking about what a community of practice is and what a community of practice is all about. We'll also find out what's been happening behind the scenes since we last met. Actually, can I get a quick hands up um, of uh, people who were here at the last session? Just use the hands up function if you were here last time. And let's try and gather how many people this are coming for the second time. Ah, oh, fabulous. Keep going. So we're just doing a little hands up if you were here last time. Welcome back, everybody who was here last time and welcome those of you who are joining us for the first time. Lovely. Right, I'm going to, I think there's a way that you can um, take everybody's hands down. But I can't figure out how to do that now, possibly. So that's. I won't, I'll shut up about that and reshare my screen. Put your hands down, everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, welcome everybody who was here last time and those of you who are here today. So yes, we're going to think about what a community of practice is and what it's all about, what the why a community of practice. And then we're going to hear some bits from what's happening since our last event. Um, what is our community of practice? What's important to us as a collective? I'm going to talk you through some of the strength and balance interventions um, and have a brief think about some of the research. Then we can't talk about physical activity and have you all sitting still for two hours. So you've got an opportunity for a quick stretch and grabbing a coffee or a cup of tea or something. And then we're all coming back together again and really spending a good chunk of time on what a community of practice is, which is hearing from you and sharing and learning together. And we're going to do that in the breakout rooms. Um, we're going to have some facilitated conversations there. Um, right, let's get started. 
let's go. Let's go on to Beth to hear about our um, from our patients. Great. Yeah. So I'll just do a quick introduction. Um, so some of you may have seen this video before, um, but um, also some of you may have not. So bear with us if you have. It's always a good video to, to watch again. Um, I watch it about every two weeks anyway, uh, as part of training that I deliver. Um, we're going to watch a story that helps give insight into the challenges we see in acute care uh, in particular, but it also helps um, highlight the issues we see across um, our communities. June is the focus of our story, um, a lovely lady. Um, but as we watch, I want you to think about who your June might be. Um, it might be a particular patient or group of patients that you see. It might be a family member or a friend. It might be a resident of yours or a service user. Service user, excuse me. It could even be you. Uh, this issue extends across time and communities, uh, and it's an issue that we foresee uh, could get worse. Um, so if we roll on the video, um, have that in mind as you watch this video. My name is June Andrews. I'm 84. This is the story of my trip to hospital. It started one Friday evening when I had a fall in the bathroom. My husband called the out of hours doctor who told us to call 999. Arthur couldn't help me get back up on my feet. I had a nasty bruise over my right hip. I wasn't keen on coming into hospital, but they persuaded me. I was on call when Mrs. Andrews was brought in and I arranged a hip x-ray. There was no fracture, but some blood and urine tests showed that she was a little dehydrated and had a possible water infection. Mrs. Andrews was moved on to the acute medical unit. She was getting... ...getting close to breaching the four hour target. It was also getting late and the AMU was a safer place to assess her and get her back on her feet. We put up a drip and gave her some antibiotic tablets for the urine infection. On Saturday morning, she was seen by the on-call medical consultant. Before we could look at her mobility, the patient flow team insisted we move her to the first available medical bed. She was not reviewed again medically till Monday. There is no routine physiotherapy or occupational therapy over weekends so we couldn't refer her to the home rehabilitation team before then. By Monday, June had been on either a trolley or in a bed with the cot sides up for three nights because she was deemed to be at high risk of falls and the nurses had inserted a urinary catheter. She was seen that Monday morning by the physiotherapist who got her out of bed with the aid of a Zimmer frame. My home ward is in the elderly care unit we do our best to provide a regular liaison service to other wards, although we wish the doctors there had more knowledge about managing older patients. The ward doctors and occupational therapists made a plan to get some more information about June's usual abilities and past medical history. I'm June's husband. On Monday, I was able to get back into the hospital to see her on the ward. I told the ward doctors and nurses that June had been getting more unsteady recently had suffered another fall and that her memory isn't what it used to be. The review team discovered that her blood pressure was dropping very low when she stood up, postural hypertension. It often leads to falls and faints in older people. We stopped a couple of her cardiac medications to try and solve this problem. By Wednesday, she was able to stand with assistance. The physios came to see her and a plan was made to refer her for ongoing rehabilitation in the local community hospital before going home. But not for the first time, there were no community beds and by the 10th day of June's admission, the cardiology ward desperately needed beds for acute cardiac patients and she was moved to a winter escalation ward. After all those moves, Mrs Andrews had become confused and agitated. She had another fall, sprained her wrist and now she required two nurses to transfer her from bed. June spent increasing time in bed with the cot sides up. By day 12 of her admission, the community hospital phoned back saying that she had no rehab potential and should have a care package instead. 
she was referred to social services with a target discharge date for Friday. But the package couldn't be put in place till the following Tuesday. She went home with a three times a day care package, but with no clear diagnosis for her progressive memory impairment and falls. Seven weeks after her discharge from hospital, June had fallen twice more. Her memory was worsening and Arthur was becoming stressed, concerned and exhausted. June ended up being admitted for respite to a local care home. Mrs Andrews never got back to her own home after her respite. We should have more care and support for older people like her outside hospital and those services need to respond much earlier to people's needs. But the way we treated her in hospital and our difficulty getting her back on her feet and home again didn't help. With so many frail older people coming into hospital, we have to get this stuff right for everyone. Great. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight um, into the acute world. This video was published eight years ago, um, but unfortunately the story isn't an uncommon one for lots of older or frail people in our society. In fact, the problem's probably even greater in 2022 than it was in 2014 when the video was made. And this is why our community of practice is so, so important because we want to prevent this from happening to even more people and we want people to live their lives really well. So we're now going to hear about what, how we as a community of practice can help change the stories uh, of those around us. Thanks, Beth. I'm finding that uh, video really emotional, actually, just to completely overshare with you all. Um, June could be my granny right now who uh, fell several weeks ago and um, ended up going from hospital to a care home. She got home to her own home last week, which we were all absolutely thrilled about. And she fell again last night and is currently in A&E. Um, so this feels really pertinent and really important on a personal level, but it feels really important from a professional level. So let's be that ripple create that ripple of change all of us so that we don't need to um, have these stories continuing to be shared in years to come. Thank you Beth, really lovely story, thank you. So last time you all filled in a bit of a, those of you who came, um, you filled in a survey afterwards for us and thank you for doing that. The, what we heard last time from you all and this survey um, has really helped inform our work. On the screen there, you can see um, some of the answers to the question, what do you want personally from this community of practice? And we felt that real desire for support in forming connections with each other and with other people. Personally, I think that's so interesting. This community of practice was formed as a result of lockdown. And last time we heard the devastating effects that lockdown had on our population's physical activity levels and a bit about the predicted number of falls that would happen if we did nothing. And so thank you that you are now part of that story for doing something. It just feels great. So. This next slide is too wordy, I apologise. There are too many words on that slide, but they are absolutely brilliant words because they summarise what the aims of a community of practice is. And really it is about being stronger together, sharing, learning, collaborating, generating new knowledge across all the areas that we work in. And that's why this is an ICS wide project. We're aiming to bring together acute sector community, voluntary sector, social care, all the different people who are involved in keeping people upright, keeping people moving safely and keeping people strong. The session back in November that many of you attended has really helped shape the work of this community of practice. And as a small project team, we've used everything we heard last time and these brilliant words on the screen to inform what we're doing today and what we're doing moving forwards. And as we move forwards, we really want to continue to be led by you for this community of practice to be informed by what's important to you, to share and celebrate your work, your ideas, your knowledge. And for that, we need you to make it all happen. 
do we have any social media experts in our midst? Could one of you help moderate a Facebook group so that we can continue the conversation outside of these forums? Do you have documents or resources that you want to share or ask questions about? What do you think would really help uh, each other across the system know about your service? We'd love to have these so that we can include them on some sort of online platform and share them with you all. Do you run strength and balance exercise classes and want to generate more referrals into your groups? How can we help you to help others? So now I'm going to hand over to Rachel, who's going to talk us through a bit about our community of practice for falls and physical activity. Thanks, Alice. Hi, everyone again. Um, so brilliant to see so many people and I think there's a few messages flying around with our group just overwhelmed at how many people and also how many new people are coming into this space which is which is brilliant so for some of you that are new obviously hearing some of this for the first time but which is quite pertinent because there's just a couple of slides now about the what we heard like Alice was saying from that first community of practice back in November and how that's really helped us shape our thinking for what do we do with this going forward what did you all say those that were on that call um, and how do we build from that going forward and we've done a lot of stepping back and trying to make sense of what we heard so there was um, great conversations last time around what helps people and what um, potentially stops people from moving more as we get older um, and what's you know what's important generally around this community and there was a lot of information there as you can imagine we did a whole piece on kind of capturing that and what you're seeing now with these couple of slides is just trying to summarize that so that we can show you all what what we think are those main themes and then how do we build on that and quite importantly how do we then want to observe what change might may be happening um going forward against against these different sort of themes so as you can see we've kind of got an overarching bit of a, a um statement there about the general vision for this which really i think if anything you take take that bottom line it's about leading to stronger health um, happier healthier healthier people sorry that's ultimately why we're coming together and um you'll see that what came through um was these three eight these three sort of shared aims if you like around workforce development and really recognizing the the wider workforce it's all of us on this call and it's everybody who has you know um um an, an impact on somebody as as we're all getting older to support them um to sort of live well and and keep moving so it could be you know it could be family members it could be carers hospital staff um us in professional roles it's so many people and we really need to recognize that everybody has got a role in that so what you know some things that we were hearing last time were how are we as people in the workforce supported what knowledge do we have how do we share that how do we build on that we also heard something really clearly around the um the activity that's happening around the county at different levels and the some of that um around the evidence base and practice in particular which we're going to come on to today and we heard lots of things around well what's happening and is it coordinated is it accessible do people know what's happening is there clear pathways into a, you know through where everybody's living in the in the communities that make up the county and the city and then we had a really clear thing as well around how we position physical activity around this conversation around falls prevention and this real need to have a shift much more to prevention and that mindset shift and are people being supported to think in that way are we valuing and really prioritizing the prevention side of things and if we're not why are we not and how do we how do we shift that because we know that's what's going to help people do more brilliant stuff around this work and um, and the three circles, just to draw your eye to that, are just a recognition that when we're talking about all this stuff, these shared aims, we are talking about it in these three settings. And that's kind of just, again, as we step back and listen to it, we heard about what this means in our care settings, our clinical and community settings. So it's just good as a reference point just to bring our conversations back to what that means for within care. What does that mean within clinical? And what does that mean within community settings? So on the next slide, we um, it's just a another way of being able to um, illustrate the conversation which we were having last time. And um, we again, what I was saying before, we had these great conversations around what helps and what hinders people from moving more. Um, and the reason for illustrating it in, in this kind of way is that it really helps us consider what, like we were saying before, what change 
are we seeing? And we're going to do some of that reflection work today. Um, and what change do we want to see against these different levels, if you like? And really, it's important to show it in this way because there's an understanding that they're all interacting with each other. Um, and that the positive changes which we can see will no doubt be small steps. And that's, you know, they may feel small, but that's OK. We know that lots of small steps will create big change in this work. Um, so we we heard just to draw your eye back to the 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 um the illustration in the middle here is we heard lots in those conversations around reflections on the individual themselves how their own perceptions of how they're um, able to move more or what's accessible in their community so what opportunities they've got to to move more and who's supporting them to do that we then heard about the community that sits around that individual and everything that impacts on them so the um that that kind of wider workforce who are supporting that individual or as they're moving in and around care um settings or clinical settings what's what's impacting on that individual and how are they being supported or not to move and then we heard about that wider system piece which is probably more around that theme about how we're positioning physical activity what are those um that sort of cultural piece about about what's impacting our conversations and the priorities that we are or aren't putting on this um so we to sort of look at it, look at it as a whole piece. We want to observe the change against these different levels and have the conversations around that because we know that coming out the other side with those small steps that lead to change, we're going to see again that vision of a stronger, happier, healthier people. So moving on, just two more slides just to show you a different way of, of how we've tried to capture some of this work. We'd love to get your feedback and feedback on how useful something like this is. We may do it in the future, but only if it's useful and only if the community find it an interesting tool to sort of take away and, and share share with others. But it's an illustration, this first one about the work, our first kind of period of time as a as a group that came together around this work, how it was driven by the need to not work in silo and to want to put our energy into creating change around deconditioning and on the bottom there what we saw coming out really early on in the work that we did together leading up to that first community practice in November was this ripple effect that we started to learn from each other just as a project group and I've you know I personally learned heaps of stuff from the people that have been involved in this project group and then from the wider community and then when we moved into that first November session we really began to see that shared knowledge starting to happen and with that ripple effect we we also appreciate that's really hard to observe and to capture. It's much harder than capturing numbers, but it's really important that we try and capture it. And we're going to start to try and do some of that today. Those reflections on the last um, five, six months of our work is trying to understand the ripples of our learning and how we're sharing that. Um, and the next illustration, my final slide is um, what we then the sort of next chunk of time of this work so as you can see top right hand corner from when we have the first community what what were we hearing and what are we trying to make sense of as a, as a project group and right in the middle there really sticks out to me is the person the patient the resident the citizen the client whatever we call them the person in the middle was really loud and clear that they are central to that they, they are the purpose of of all of, all of this work and um, that person centred thinking, we heard bits about how do we get patient voice in. We've just heard some stuff right at the start from Beth um, and we want to continue getting that into that space. So a real ask of today is how do we keep doing that? And what we've thought about is how we could all possibly take away questions that we can be asking people that we're interacting with and bring that insight back into the next community practice so how do we best do that and what questions might we want to ask so something to think about in your breakout spaces um and yeah just draw your eye just to that bottom bit again we definitely saw the continuation of that ripple effect we in the survey that was mentioned before heard that 70 percent of people that came on that first session they went and spoke to somebody else about it those those are those small steps that we're talking about and that ripple effect will continue to grow i think that's me Thanks, Rachel. It's really lovely just spending a moment to reflect back on the work that we've done. November does feel a really long time ago. And as a project group, we've been meeting really regularly to continue to drive this work forwards. So it's great to hear it summarised and see it illustrated there. Thank you. So 
that's what we did last time and we're going to bring all of that into today's session. We also heard from you the importance of evidence based practice and that's what we're going to spend the uh, next few moments thinking about. Um, and I'm going to bring us back to why we established this community of practice for falls prevention and physical activity. And this next section is specifically going to focus on the re what the research says works for physical activity and strength and balance interventions. With the acknowledgement that falls prevention does include more than physical activity and strength and balance, and that uh, falls are often multifactorial and require that MDT assessment and intervention. So what I'm aiming to do in the next uh, few moments is to plant some seeds of thought about how we can all be involved in the patient's journey for supporting them in being stronger and moving more safely. Some of us on the call might be very explicitly doing this. Um, those of us who are directly involved in delivering rehabilitation or reconditioning or reablement. And there will be others on the call who are supporting these interventions, either through referrals into different services or through conversations that we're having with the same patients or clients, residents. And I think if we all have a better understanding of what works, how it works and why it works, then we get to have better conversation with our patients and with each other so that we can get the right thing for the right person at the right time. So, for example, we know that managing expectations, taking away that first initial fear of doing something new is crucial in supporting people with long term health conditions to be more active. And this is where supporting those local connections is really, really important. Something as simple as knowing the name of the instructor who's going to be delivering the class that you're referring somebody into can be so useful. OK, so. What does the evidence say? Well, multifactorial falls risk assessments reduce falls by 24% and should be offered to all older people who are fallen or at risk of falls. And based on assessment findings, a person centred care plans developed and the care plan may well include options that assist individuals to achieve their agreed goals. We heard both of those things loudly um, from you last week, uh, last time rather, um, on what helps people to move more. Individualised assessment and agreed goals. Um, for example, it's about taking um, risk taking based on in, an individual's strengths and that proactive approach, helping people to remain active and live well. Multifactorial risk assessments do reduce those do reduce falls and exercise can prevent falls in community dwelling older adults and programs that challenge balance and are of a longer duration have larger effects with 39% reduction in falls in the community dwelling adults and up to 42% of those who have a history of falls. And these programmes that they're referencing are often Otago and Fane. Last time we heard some brilliant stories from Sarah who runs strength and balance exercise classes in Nottinghamshire and there's a wealth of evidence to support these interventions. We know that programmes like FAME and Otago help to stop people falling over and the randomised controlled trials show the, of, and the results of the randomised controlled trials are pretty great when it comes to reduction in number of falls. In Sarah's stories last time, we also heard about the impact of exercise intervention has on fear of falling. And again, that isn't just Sarah's story. We've got evidence to back this up. Fear of falling affects about 50% of people who have fallen and up to 50% who have never fallen. So, and it can reduce confidence and independence, lead to social, social isolation. And exercise programmes help reduce fear of falling in the short term without increasing the risk or frequency of falls. The evidence base is so strong that there's lots of national guidance when it comes to exercise interventions for falls. The National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, NHS Right Care, uh, Public Health England, or should I say Office for Health Improvement and Disparities, 
the Chief Medical Officer Guidelines uh, for Physical Activity, they all recommend that people at risk of falling have strength and balance exercise programmes as part of their local falls pathway. So what is it about the strength and balance programmes in particular that works? So if we take FAME, for example, or Otago for that matter, they that are both strength and balance uh, elements of these programmes are progressive, they're individually tailored and challenge balance. They're often completed uh, three times a week for six months or more, and they are the things that specifically work to prevent falls. So if we take the Otago programme, for example, Otago is actually completed over one year with regular intervention from physiotherapists. And that intervention was phone calls as well as face to face visits. The phone calls pr prompted behaviour change and encouraged participation. The face to face and visit face to face visits ensured that the techniques were correct and that the programme was tailored to an individual needs. Some of the people on this program in the research trial were using um, ankle weights up to eight kilograms. I don't know if I've ever done that in clinical practice, actually. But the bottom line is that the, the participant in the exercise should feel like it's hard work. You need to feel a bit sweaty. You need to feel like in those strength elements, you don't really want to do another one or two. On the screen there, you'll see a graph that shows strength and balance over a, uh, a lifetime with the disability thresholds in there. And you'll see that prevention is better than cure and that moving more in our earlier life helps prevent disability as we grow older. However, that doesn't mean that we can't do something even for our most frail older adults. As multiple studies have demonstrated that um, improvements can be made with resistance exercise training and they've been found to increase strength in older adults. Studies have demonstrated that these changes can occur even into the ninth decade of life. So with huge benefits, why haven't we stopped everybody falling over by giving them strength and balance exercises? The research shows that that progressive strength and balance interventions, if they're done right at the right dose, they work. But that's not the whole story. There's also some research particularly done within the Otago program where where people actually decrease their physical activity levels. When the research team delved a little deeper, they found that the participants were treating this intervention a bit like a magic pill. I'll take the pill. I've done my strength and balance exercises. I don't need to do anything else. That's enough for today. And actually, we can't just do the strength and balance bit. We also need to move more, even if that's just standing up. It's about sitting less and moving more. So physical activity has been the missing piece of the jigsaw for some of the participants in that particular trial. So what do we need to make strength and balance interventions work on a really practical level? Well, I think it's probably conversations about motivation, goal setting, that personalised intervention, holding the patient at the centre of all of our conversations. And this was one of the positive things we heard from you last time, the importance of goal setting and uh, individually tailoring and personalising interventions. And that's a theme in the research too. FAME and Otago programmes advocate for this personalised and tailored intervention. The weights, for example, have progressed by the person, not by the number of weeks somebody's been participating. On the screen there, we've got the Five Eyes framework, and this was developed um, in the Easier to be Active research, where the team specifically looked at physical activity for people with long term health conditions. And they found that there were five really important things to engage people with long term health conditions in moving more. They were individualized, so things needed to um, work for the person. Us as health and social care and voluntary sector professionals working out what's right for the, my, the person sat in front of me. They needed to be integrated, ensuring that we've got pathways between health, leisure, sport, social care. 
and influencers. They recognise the importance of others. And we heard that too last time from all of you. We heard about the importance of family and carers in this space. The easier to be active research also talks about the importance of peers and informing people of the benefits and what you and expectations of increasing their physical activity. So, for example, in that strength and balance work, we want you to feel a bit wobbly and that's not a bad thing, but we're going to challenge you in a safe and meaningful way. And inclusivity was also a key part of this research and went on with easier to be active. We heard this from all of you. These are themes that are running through our conversations last time and they're themes in the research. Oh, I love it when you find a bit of research that absolutely backs up your clinical practice and what you're doing out there. Feels really good, doesn't it? So the research for effective strength and balance interventions were completed in frail old adults, many of whom were able to sit to stand independently. And this may be the person that many of you are working with on the call today. But it may be somebody like June Andrews, who we heard from at the beginning, uh, that story that we heard at the beginning, who perhaps she was that person before she fell. But thanks to all the things that we did or perhaps didn't do while she was in hospital, she's now not able to do that. So how are we as a health and social care system preparing our patients to really receive the, the intervention that we know works? It may be directly through rehabilitation interventions. Uh, it may be that we are having conversations with our patients about moving more and prepping them to get to the point where they're able to sit stand independently and participate in programmes such as FAME or Otago. What I'd like you to do and take away to your teams and your the uh, networks that you work in is how can we progress our patients from rehabilitation and reablement through chair base to Otago to fame to regular participation and activities that support strength and balance, but more importantly, bring a patient joy. Where does your role fit in this continuum of movement? And how can you take our patients, our clients, our residents and support them on this moving more journey? That's my bit done. I'm going to hand you over to Fran, who's going to talk us through the next three moments of the Community of Practice event today. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Alice. That was absolutely incredible to hear. Um, and thank you, Rachel, from before and also Beth. Um, just as a really quick update, while we've been um, listening to the presentations, we've been continuing with the people attending this morning. And I just want to say that we're over an eight, 80 now on the call, which is just phenomenal, um, which um, leads me to say that we're going to actually be moving into breakout rooms for nine breakout rooms, and they're all going to be led by a facilitator. And the, the reason behind this is for us to look in a smaller setting, for us all to have opportunity to share our experiences and, reflect, and our reflections on actually what's been happening since around about November last year when we had our first event. Um, for those of you that were there and for those of you that weren't, matters not. It's just really about looking at um, the conversations that we've been happening, the things that we've been seeing, the things that we may have been influencing. So the falls prevention, um, there was a, a couple of people from day services who were actively encouraging mobility, which was really fantastic to keep people as well as possible. Um, we talked about the acute sector and the length of stay going up because there wasn't the ability to get people out of hospital quickly. Sometimes that actually meant it was a good therapy outcome because there was more therapy happening within the hospital. Um, so the, the patient didn't necessarily have bad outcomes because of that, but it did mean they were in hospital bed a lot longer than they should have been. Um, if people are kept fitter and more mobile in the community, their acute condition is better managed and hopefully better recovery outcomes. Um, talked about learning disability groups linking in with physios um, and a lot of communities needing more exercise group options to access. And then into the social care setting, uh, 
various that ha COVID has hampered a lot of sort of initiatives that have been started and hopefully by summer they'll be back um, up and running. Um, but there's some training about dementia and falls going on in day services and trusted assessor training. Um, Excellent. Yeah, no, that, that's that's <laughs> fabulous. Yeah, thank you so much, Amarine. Um, that's a really good summary of quite a long discussion. So um, I'm going to come to Fran's group next, Fran Platz's group next. So whoever was in Fran Platz's group, if, if one person wants to shout up and, and be brave. We were group seven and we were a really diverse group. Hi, guys in group seven. Does anybody want to take the floor on this or would you like me to? Happy for you to. Oh, kiddo. So we had a mixture of people that had been with us in on the November community of practice or hadn't. That mattered not. We had a great conversation about actually we really did feel that things were starting to feel different. Um, one of the biggest things was the um, working together. We did feel that the different organisations were wor working more closely together and that falls prevention and physical activity from a positioning point of view was taking more of a priority, um, which was really, really positive. We did still feel that actually it was quite um, selective as to where there might be additional services, particularly voluntary, that could support our patients to be more active. Um, lots of positive conversations. Some of the negatives were still around the fact that we're aware that um, waiting lists to see professionals are so, so very, 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 very high that people referring in were having to be really selective about who they referred, whereas actually majority of people that they might see over 70 could actually find a referral useful, but they would have to be very, very selective and actually that professional referrals into services, then services were very time limited still. So actually what could be achieved was really, really challenging. And then offers to pick up activities in the community that might require transport or the patient um, client going to independently. Um, there were barriers there because obviously from a confidence point of view, post COVID, it's a major thing for people to be able to do to get out and about again. Um, and we heard from Fiona who, um, works in the voluntary sector and um, takes the referrals from the social prescribers to help people transition to coach and encourage and just get out and walk a little bit more um, which is a pilot but absolutely amazing um, work that, that that she's doing. Um, we heard from the start team that are doing a lot more data collection around falls um, and really sort of um, drilling down and homing in on that. But actually, we could do with more support together around our data collection and how can we help one another with that. We heard about Beck, uh, heard from Beck Hughes come back in February, who's a sport development officer. And she really was the one that hit home to us all that she's really noticed a difference in terms of the different partners working together. Um, we had a manager from public health was wonderful to have on the on our conversation in our room and the priorities in public health around falls prevention and physical activity absolutely up there. So great, great positives um, within our conversations. Thank you all of you. Wonderful. Thanks, Fran and, uh, and group seven. Uh, Michelle, can I come to your group next? Is there someone from Michelle's group that uh, is feeling like they're able to share? I'm fairly confident, Beth, that there will be. We had a, an amazing group of um, women and Errol. <laughs> <laughs> women and Errol. <laughs> Does anybody want to share? I'm happy to. Great. I can. Um, we had a bit of a mixture as well of people that had attended in November and, and newcomers. Um, I think there was a lot of... Um, confidence in the increase in access to PSI and Otago um, groups in the community. Uh, a lot of talk about um, integration and um, kind of follow ups and referrals and the use of social prescribers. Um, also, we um, we discussed around the waiting lists and how that can impact on things, um, particularly when we have such a short window of opportunity between identifying a patient need and then um, making an onward referral and then that referral being picked up. Um, but um, I think it was Kate in our group who mentioned that carers and family can be a really good bridge to that gap if we start the work with them early and 
and help with the education for the whole family rather than just the patient or client. That's a really wonderful Apologies point. if I've missed anything. No, it was brilliant, Sadie. <laughs> Can I just say and um, that it was the energy, the sort of recognising of the challenges that um, that we're facing and the conditions of which we're working, but the energy and the commitment to want to work together and, and uh, to look at action as well as what's already been done was amazing. It was really, really brilliant group to listen to. Excellent, yeah, and lovely to see you here, Sadie. I play netball with Sadie, so uh, great to see her. Alice's group. Oh, sorry, my fire alarm's just going off. So perfect timing for somebody from my group to um, feedback, please. <laughs> it's a test. The building's not on fire. OK, good. Yeah. Is there anyone from Alice's group that is able just to give a, a few words? If not, it has just finished, so I can come in. <laughs> I think um, for times... For for time's sake, let's go for you, Alice. And then yeah. if anyone wants to dip in, then that's fine. Or they can put something in the chat. Great idea. Thank you, Beth. I think we heard some real challenges in the group about some local changes that have um, happened in terms of therapy teams and how they're organised and working. We heard some challenges around um, uh, waiting lists in the community and how that's really uh, leading people to deconditioning. In terms of the opportunities, there was a real desire to work together and want to know those local people, those place-based uh, conversations. We want to know who you I I each of you are. We want to put names to faces and have phone numbers um, and that desire of a bit of a directory of services so that we can um, easily find one another. Um, so it was great to hear out of some really challenging times some ideas being generated around um, what would be useful. Excellent lovely thank you very much good job Alice's group. Um, should we go to Fran Hallam's group next? Yep yeah, um, so I'm happy for the feedback or if somebody else wants to, to um, feedback for group two if you want to chip in now. We'll wait a few no, seconds. It's always a difficult one, isn't it? Like how much how much time do we wait? <laughs> I'm happy to get going. If anyone yep. wants to chip in, then please do. Um, so we had a bit of a little um, multidisciplinary team in our group. So we had representation from across different settings of community, acute, MSK, mental health um, and different professions as well. Um, and it's really interesting to see that, that a lot of work has gone on since November but, um, and there's been a lot, there was a lot of fantastic work shared around QI projects that were going on. Um, particularly around things like using the guide to action tools for falls in different areas and settings and also with um, looking at how we link in better with um, with the local community um, and things like link roles and social prescribing services and I think that was one of the things that there were sort of two main things really that came out of those discussions one being the fact that the need to move this into a more of a social discussion and the vital importance of creating links within the community um, and thinking about how we access those those links and those different really important people um, and perhaps that being a little bit more challenging for some people in the acute sector who don't necessarily have those links with voluntary voluntary services um, and then the other thing we were saying about is that there was so much brilliant stuff being shared that everyone was really interested to hear about and wanted to know more about and we discussed the need to perhaps have some sort of forum for sharing that outside of these meetings um, so the things we were talking about were whether we could use something like the NHS Futures platform, um, which might be good from an IG perspective, um, whether we need a newsletter or whether we have a Facebook group. But it feels like there needs to be some way of continuing those links and discussions was sort of the main things that we captured from our discussion. Excellent. Lovely. Thanks, Bran and, uh, and your group. Rachel, can we go to your group next? Yeah, sure. Um, was was uh, was any would anybody like to um to chip in with a couple of points before I make a few observations? I'm really happy for anyone else to though. We're really keen to hear from from people other than the facilitators, but we appreciate it if you're not feeling super confident. Go for it, Rachel. Go for it. Someone chip in if if not. Um, 
what I heard from in terms of things that have been happening is um, some interesting reflections from the reablement team in the county council about how they better embed their Otago training. They'd like to do more of that. Um, some reflections about the mixture of what we're seeing about community based provision gaps in some areas or a lack of awareness. So we're doing a bit of joining up and we're going to pick that up. And then some great stuff where we're seeing lots of development happening in some areas of the um, of the county. And there was some great sharing of knowledge about the value that we want to put on making a charge to sessions. And there was a bit of uh, sense checking with people that have got experience around that. So some sharing of that was brilliant. There was some um, reflection from Joe from the um, AGK Derbyshire team about how they've done a lot of work with an e-learning online um, uh, piece of training which is available to everybody so we were interested in being able to share that and Joe was um, talking about the work that they've done as a team in Derbyshire and how they want to share that wider. Um, those were some of my main points there's a couple of great points on resident voice which I might put into the Q&A in a bit. Yeah oh, thank you very much. Kerrin, should we head to your group is that there anyone from Kerrin's group that, that feels able to share? There were some lovely people from my group, I'm sure, that are all very articulate and real great energy and, and, and positive input as well. I don't know if anybody you, wants to. You made the notes, Karen, so I think that's my issue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was counting on you, Paula. That's fine. I will, um, I will um, just uh, feedback what I heard. Um, there was very, there again, uh, Picking up from what Rachel's group as well around the re-enablement teams um, that are working, and there's some great links into there um, and 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 the work that that's happening with that. Uh, there was very much um, some. Is the, uh, I suppose uh, an exploration about having some of the right uh, information in the right format in the right easily accessible place so people can dip into that. That would be something that was found to be quite useful uh, to really help around advocacy and awareness. And, and we talked about workforce, whether that be the professional workforce, um, so of which was represented in that group, but also very much coming through was about that enabling workforce, so the families and the carers. And, and there was something that really came out as a theme was around um, uh, individuals who were erring on the side of caution, whether that be healthcare professionals or whether that be uh, families and friends and carers, um, and, and how this can sometimes cause harm and deconditioning um, and, and pressure sores and things were, were, were talked about and looking at the, that risk versus benefits and how if you go too far either way of that, that actually can, can, can cause more harm and, and that sort of around that prevention. I think one thing that word that was happening is complicated. Um, so it's not one thing, it's lots of things um, and how um, you know, uh, particularly around training, education and resource. Um, but we had some great insight from Bjorn as well, who who was is an acute medical physician at Sherwood Forest um, Hospital Trust and how he was looking at it from a ward perspective and what he was seeing on wards and, and, and some of the barriers that were coming in about enabling people on wards. But then we heard from Jackie, who from an OT perspective out into the community was also having similar challenges around families as well just trying to genuinely protect and, and, and help um, but actually was it helping but there needs to be some more advocacy and training to support that I think that was the essence speak up please if if not if, if there's anything else but yeah we could have gone on for, for ages but a really fascinating conversation great job Karen thank you lovely brilliant and then who am I forgetting is it Helen Or have I not for, not forgotten any facilitators? Helen and James, I think. Yeah. Helen and James, sorry. You go first, Helen. Uh, so we had a few technical issues <laughs> where uh, three of the groups struggled to join and couldn't talk and had black screens and everything. So we didn't quite get to the conversation quite as juicily as we possibly could have. However, um, what we did, the things that I started to hear from the group were the challenges around um, the the um, well, actually, the first thing that I think was um, that was a really positive to be said was that the 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 slide that we re you referred to, Alice, around um, 
the the statistics and the numbers and the the facts and what's actually happening and that and that the value that that can bring to sharing that and using that in our work we did feel was something that that came through is actually we need to be singing about this more the impact that moving can have on this and how we do that more so there's a there was a, a, a I think a consensus there around that that was really important and um, we talked about um the, we had Lucas from the physiotherapy team and um, from NUH and um, just talking around the how the challenge has been so great because of the deconditioning of people, the amount of falls and the, the work that's going on there um, and then how that connects back into the community. So we had um, some, some um, members in our group were from the um, uh, County Council um, care provision and how that that then how do we connect that better how do we enable that how do we connect to everything um there's so the challenges around that making sure things are individualized and how do we ensure that the support that is given to residents is really got them at the heart of that um, and the complexity of that which nothing really different to what others have said one thing that really resonated with me that andy from the county council mentioned was around um during COVID and because of what's gone on and the challenges that care homes are now facing, activities and the nice things got went and have gone and are struggling to come back and actually those activities are pos a part of that prevention work and so there's something there for us to consider around how, well, how do we get those activities going again and how do we enable stuff to start so um and help around that and what might that that might look like so Excellent. yeah we're, um I think that's we start we were getting going and then Lucas literally got cut off halfway through what he was oh, saying to come back so <laughs> it's really hard and it, it's often things we can talk about all day isn't it so uh, yeah thank you very much uh, and James last but not least last but not least we were we were room nine we we had a, a really great group lots of energy and passion so I'm um, I'll just open up if there's anyone who does want to share I'm I'm sure there will be there was some great people in the group <laughs> um, yeah, it's trying to shut me up on fools. Is, I'm like trying to shut Alice up on fools, really. Um, <laughs> Go for it, Tamsin. Oh, yeah, you've got 60 seconds. Um, so, uh... so um, I think I was the only person that had um, come to a second group of practice. Everybody else were kind of newbies. Um, real common thing with everybody wanting to learn more about fools, to be working um, more together in a more integrated way, but kind of like the challenges of that, of kind of like, how we actually free up the workforce capacity to access training and be released when there's so many kind of like staff pressures, um, how that training works across the different settings of kind of there's, there's common factors with that, but different things that individuals need to know um, and that how complex all the pathways are with, you know, cities different from county and that's different from Mansfield. You know, so, so kind of needing to know that information, but feeling that that's quite a lot to to unpick and you know a, a real keenness for us to to know who to be referring to how to be doing things um i'm feeling that's quite a, a task to take on but that there's a lot of kind of passion for people to be to be doing that wonderful lovely that's really wonderful thank you thanks for everyone sharing their thoughts i'm now going to hand over to alice who's just going to open up open up the floor a little bit Wow, we I don't know how I can quite follow that. The energy in this room is incredible. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We've only got 10 minutes left and I was thinking that we would finish early, but I think everybody's thoughts and opinions and voices here has really um, pushed us on on our time. What we wanted to do here was open the floor to you all. This community is about you. It's about work that is important to you and it's things that feel questions that you want to hear that we as a community can answer. It's not about an ask, ask the panel or, or an ask an expert necessarily, because you are the experts. You are the people who can do this. I am, however, going to be very mean and say we've only got about five, six minutes to do this, however. So if there are any questions, can I ask you to put, use the hands up function or to pop some comments in the chat? Over to you guys. Ask away. I just want to add, if you see any questions that you can answer and we don't have enough time to answer it, please grab their email and email them outside of this meeting. So I can see that one of the questions here is um, we, that didn't get to discuss is around deconditioning. 
because we can't measure deconditioning effectively, is it that we prioritise falls prevention? Can we measure falls rates quite comprehensively? Anybody got any thoughts on how we measure both deconditioning and our falls? Go for it, Paula. Thank you. It's OK. So I'm, I'm thinking it needs to be function related. So what is a function that somebody has? What can't they do now? Um, and, and actually then, but making sure that when we're thinking about the function, that we're thinking about the strength required to do it and the balance. So um, people are very often thinking about cardiovascular fitness, but let's also already make sure that if we're looking at reaching up for a cupboard, what's the strength required for that? Why is it important that we keep our arms as active and as strong as it is our legs and our bottoms? Um, that type of thing. So it's, it's making sure that people can unpick those parts of physical activity from the CMO's guidelines that we're supposed to be promoting within a function that somebody's doing. As healthcare professionals, we love, fun we love the science, but the people we're working with want function. Oh, lovely. Thank you for bringing it back to our patients. That's what we're here about. Thank you, Paula. Anybody else got any experience on how we do this? Um, is that Paula with her hand up again? Oh, Andrew. Andrew Harris, come in, please. Uh, <laughs> mine, mine wasn't on how you measure um, deconditioning. I, I literally, I've got an Apple Watch and it's reminded me to stand. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just wondering if sort of technology could be used, because it, it does this every hour, it tells me off essentially and tells me to stand for a few minutes. I'm just wondering if sort of technology could be brought in that, you know, kind of nags people to stand regularly or move uh, like my watch does me. Lovely. Thank you, Andrew. Mine does too. And I get a real kick out of it when it says goal achieved for my steps. There's something very motivating about that, isn't there? Yeah. Sally, would you like to come in here? Yeah, I was just thinking that um, it's kind of what people have already said, really, but exercise and activity without it being exercise and activity, you know, making things functional is so individual for different people, you know, what different people want and need to do. So, you know, my thing's yoga, I love yoga and I love all things, you know, related to that, but that's not going to be exciting for everybody. So I'm trying to expand my knowledge, I guess, of what sort of different groups are around, what different sort of things are are available. And again, it's not just about activity, it's about social, social activities as well. So um, I think that, like like um, Paula said, keeping the patient at the heart of it and, and, you know, what it's not just about prescribing some exercises. It's about listening to what that patient wants to achieve. So things like the Guide to Action tool are really helpful to help conversations across different um, healthcare professionals. Thank you, Sally. That um, absolutely appeals to the physiotherapist in me and uh, what we try to achieve when we're delivering our interventions. And I'm sure it appeals to many of you who are not physios on this call as well. Paula's hand straight up. I'm coming back to Paula. Sorry, guys, just to say that remember that going out to a coffee morning is really important. It's physical activity. Getting up and getting ready can be exhausting for people that are deconditioned. Having a rest then and then going and doing something, all of that counts as physical activity. So don't forget to look for it when in whatever you're prescribing for somebody or recommending. Oh, a great top tip. Thank you, Paula. Anybody got any more thoughts around this uh, subject? I'm going to bring us to a different question that I can see in the chat here and it was around OT and equipment which of course I can't find now here we go um, has anyone used any OT specific educational activity programs with clients are the OTs in our midst or those who work with OTs are they able to answer that question Um, I'm, an, I'm answering just because I'm an OT rather than because I know the, uh, the um, we don't. I think it, it, other than being very um, trying to be very person centred and kind of go, what is the important thing for for that person? 
um, trying to embed, you know, things like getting up off the floor. I'd rather someone knew that they they were doing that so they could play with the grandkids rather than because they can like, get up after a fall. So trying to kind of give um, advice and meaningful context for that person around falls, I think, would be my kind of key thing. Um, working with fear of falling, rebuilding people's confidence, but I, we don't do like a specific one thing. There's no one thing that we do. It's all very kind of tailored to that person and what's important to them. Yes, how many times in a day do you say multifactorial? Wonderful, isn't it? I'm going to ask for... ...to answer all of these questions. It's amazing to see the chat buzzing. Um, Paula, is your hand up again to give us another comment on, on this on this one? No, sorry. <laughs> Legacy. <laughs> Um, would anybody else like to um, have share any reflections or thoughts on this? So thank you very much. Apologies that we have not given as much time as we had wanted to to this question and answer session. I think it's been really, really insightful. Um, we're just going to finish. Um, and I'm going to give Fran the impossible task of summing up today. This does feel impossible, but thank you, Fran. <laughs> Hi everybody. So in two minutes, wow, <laughs> what can I say? Firstly, thank you. Um, thank you, thank you. Please go away, reflect, inspire, ripple, talk converse, teachable moments and come back together with us because we've got more work to do. Um, I just want to share just a few strong words, quotes, thoughts with you all um, as we sum up today. So we are we are a coalition of the willing. We've come together as a community of practice and within this we have an awful lot of power. What you do makes a real difference and have the power to decide what kind of a difference that you make. We're already getting those ripples rising, aren't we? Um, life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. I think that an analogy of being on the bike, I'm not saying get your patience on your bike, but you know, you need your balance on the bike and to keep being on the bike and keeping your balance, you need to move. We need to keep moving. Sometimes it feels like the wind's forcing us away, forcing us down, coming in the wrong, wrong direction. But if the wind's not serving us to take us forward, we need to take to the oars and we really need to row through the wind and we need to move this forward. You are all incredible. We can't thank you enough as a pr project team. This is your community of practice for our people. Um, and I just want to sum up again by thanking you all. We'll be pulling all this information together. Stay involved. Keep talking to each other. And here's to... Here's to the next steps. Thank you, everybody. We're going to close there with 30 seconds to go. Wonderful. Great work, everybody. Can't thank you enough. Stronger together, we can do this. We can make a difference. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Been brilliant. Thank you very much. Look forward to the next session. Bye.